Hi, and welcome to A Nightbird. And uh, today is going to be a little different than usual because, well, mainly because I actually don't have any of my knitting with me except for this. Well, I have... I have a few things to show you, some, some finished things. Um, but also because, um, yeah, a few of you have asked me over the time since I've been doing this podcast, um, you've asked me what, what am I doing in Germany and how did I get here and uh, um, what's it like learning another language and, and living in, an, in a foreign place. Um, so I thought I would um, I'd tell that story today. It's kind of long, so... Um, so first I'll, I'll show you the things that I do have here and explain to you a little bit about why I don't have all my projects with me at the moment. Um, I tend to keep some projects at my mother-in-law's house anyway and uh, because we visit fairly often and I instead of like because often it happened that I forgot my knitting and uh, then it was kind of itching to, to do something there. So I thought why, why not keep some of my projects over there saying as I've got so many I tend to, to kind of not be monogamous with my knitting and um, it actually helps me to get all my projects done as well because then you know when I'm over there and maybe it's a project I, I wouldn't have picked up because you know I, I have my favorites um, I think okay I have to work on this because it's here so that's basically how it works and uh, the reason we've been spending more time there is because of the doctors in Berlin. We're still seeing uh, Luca's doctor there because this doctor has known Luca since he was a baby, since he was born. And I haven't found a replacement really in the area, not one that I feel I can trust 100% and, and that, you know, that really knows Luca and knows his whole kind of journey. And um, yeah, I was really impressed by her actually when I, after the whole hospital experience um I took Luca then to see her just to you know such so she had no idea because she hadn't seen him for a while and there were things that had been concerning me which I'd mentioned to some of the other doctors and she saw them straight away you know so I thought yes okay I want to see this doctor now and um she's yeah she's kind of on the ball with with what's going on with him um Speaking of doctors, by the way, um, as a side note, mum has been to see a neurologist and they think they have a, a clue as to what that what it might be. And now they're sending her to um, a, a kind of neurological eye specialist, which is a very special topic. Um, I think it's turning out that it's going to be something pretty rare. Um, so he didn't say that he knew what it was, but he said definitely um, you need to go to the specialist in Oxford. So she has to travel to, to this doctor um, and he should be able to find out what it is. So far, she doesn't have an exact date for the appointment, but um, they should be able to get it moved so that it comes. So I'm really hoping that by next time we'll have some news. Um, so anyway, I'll quickly show you what I've got here. Um, so I'm almost getting to the exciting bit on this. I was just reading about it. In fact, I'm just, um, getting to the end, to the beginning of the round and I'm going to start the lace panel. I have to say though, um, I'll show you the picture. Um, I, um, I'm finding it a little hard to judge the length of this. I know that, you know, it, it, it's, that seems maybe... Uh, crazy because I can measure it on my own body but whenever I do that it's never the same as actually when you put something on it hangs differently or you know so and I don't want it to be too short I, I hate that like when you bend over and it comes up or um, you stretch to get something and you show everyone your belly um, but on the other hand if it's too long it will be bunched up so yeah I guess that's the danger I so I, I just I think I've got it pretty much right and I'm going to start on the lace um, when, as soon as I get to the beginning of this round. Um, Hedrick had his birthday and we finished, uh, I finished this, which actually has, has turned out pretty well. So he can put his phone and whatever or even a book he can tuck in here and then this goes over the side of his bed and, and attaches with some velcro here. 
So then he doesn't have to worry about things actually crashing to the floor. Um, the other thing that I have to do is mend these socks. And uh, I don't really know what's the best way to do it, but I'm actually quite happy with what I've done there. Although it looks messy, um, it kind of gets trodden in and it's really, really solid and really uh, there, there won't be another hole there. And I'm doing it on the other sock now. But um, I'm a bit sad that they got holes in them. And I know that all socks probably get holes in them in the end, but I'm starting to think, you know, maybe I need to... I know some people actually have an extra thread. They put an extra thread in the bottom of the socks or that they take a different type of yarn. I mean, this was a very high percentage wool um, with a little acrylic, but they say that, you know, a bit more acrylic is actually good in this case, so... But it, it was a, quite a thick yarn. Um, I think I, I used size three needles, uh, three millimeter needles. Um, so that should help. Uh, I tend to use socks for extra warmth, so I'm not using like normal socks because they're a bit thinner and um, yeah. But then on the other hand, it's been a year and I wear them a lot. So I guess maybe that's all you can hope for. Yeah, so all everything else, is at my mother-in-law's house um, and I'll show them I mean I pro I'll probably do another podcast soon and I'll show it to you I'll show them to you uh, there you might see the boys actually they're out in the garden and uh, I can see them from here but uh, um, they might uh, come past the window at some point um, so yeah my story of how I came to Berlin um, well this may sound odd but I never like from as, as young as I can remember, I never felt like I belong in England. I always dreamt of living somewhere else. I always felt like I would be happier somewhere else. I mean, just th these were my fantasies as a child. I would really sit and dream of France or, of you know, I just had this romantic idea of foreign countries and... Um, I wondered if, you know, in a past life I was from another country and that type of thing. That that was really, the, the, I had these dreams as a child. Um, perhaps it had to do with the fact that we, we never really went to other countries on holiday. Um, my dad is not a big fan of travel. Not everybody is, you know, so um, he, he likes to be at home. And um, we did have holidays, but within England. Um, besides the fact that my parents are from other ends of the country, uh, opposite ends of the country. So when we had holiday, we tended to go and visit the relatives and uh, that didn't leave a lot of room for, for going to other places. Plus, I guess it's, I don't know, it, it seemed that then, back then, it was really expensive to go traveling and things are a little easier now. And it's more often that people travel. Um... Yeah, so it would just became something I dreamt of. And uh, I remember the first time that I ever went to a foreign country was France. I was 12 years old and I felt this, it, it just felt magical because um, I had to keep giving myself this reality check when I was there, like I'm in France. Like I really felt like I was on another planet. I, I felt I was having some incredible experience. Like my consciousness was was altered you know I was like a bit dizzy and looking around listening to the foreign language and I just I loved it and um, I also remember that we had croissants and hot chocolate for breakfast um, every day at the hotel um, and I don't think I'd had a croissant before I mean th things were different when I was a child or maybe it was just in my family but like this thing of like you know having lots of different cultures and experiencing them and knowing people from different places definitely wasn't really something that I experienced as a child. Um, yeah, so we, we did go to France and, um, you know, but still then, you know, I was craving that experience again, this, this feeling of like, wow, I'm in another country. And um, anyway, so as soon as I left school, really, I... Uh, I wanted to have, you know, just experience it for myself. So I got a job straight away, saved up every penny that I had to go traveling. And one of the, one of the real dreams I had was to go to America. 
Uh, also because as a child, I was exposed to so much American culture, um, you know, TV shows and songs, all like famous bands, anything like that. They were all from America. So I thought of it as this place where like, you know, anything can happen, you know, and um, um, yeah. And I just, I, I, I didn't really know much about it. I just wanted to go. And um, so we, I went with a friend, we both saved up and uh, we went to New York because, you know, we didn't really, yeah, that's, we just didn't really know where to go. So we thought like New York, I guess that's like the, the closest place to England. And, uh, um, and I, when I look back to that holiday, I think I didn't really know how to have a holiday. You know, we booked a hotel, we, we, we were in New York and we were just excited. We just were looking at stuff and like thinking, what should we do? Should we go up the Empire State Building or like, um, so, so we kind of had a kind of very tourist experience, but it was still like really exciting. And I loved as well that, you know, it was actually our language, so we didn't have to be scared. And um, yeah, so we had a fantastic time and uh, then decided that we really wanted to go back and maybe spend a bit of time there. So we um, we got involved in one of those schemes, which was like uh, to be a camp counselor, uh, working in America. And then that way um, we could spend quite a bit of time there and uh, then go traveling afterwards. So save up the money from camp and uh, and then go traveling. Not that you get paid a lot for working in a camp, but you're kind of stuck there so you don't spend any of your money. Anyway, um, we, uh, we were unprepared for how hard this was gonna be and how it was really actually an awful experience. I could not believe how just nasty and, and aggressive the people who ran the camp were. I'm sure they're not any reflection of of Americans in general and in fact I know they're not because I, I've since had very positive experiences there um, but just this was just awful and you're stuck there because it's in the middle of the countryside and we didn't have a car so um, and actually I wasn't put in the same camp as my friend we had two different camps so I was in upstate New York and she was in Maine and we could only like sometimes call each other but it wasn't possible because we were just um, overloaded with work the children in my camp were just really spoiled, um, horrible children. I, I, I don't like to say that. I'm sure, you know, yeah, they're kids, but they just had, the way they had been brought up was, um, you know, like we were supposed to be, like we were foreign and we were their servants and, you know, we were not to be treated with any respect at all. And we were shouted at by the bosses and stuff and they were they were just mean and nasty people. And we were exhausted. And the, the best thing about it was the bonding between the people who were working there and how we just were planning our escape and how we couldn't wait to leave. Um, I mean, it even came to the point where we made phone calls to the office um, that, that had employed us and we said how unhappy we were. But in the end, it's only six weeks and um, we wanted our money at the end of it so that we could go traveling. And we had a fantastic time traveling afterwards. We went down, we went south basically along the coast and um, we didn't go to Florida that time, but um, we went to Alabama. So that was like our last destination. I had a great time in Alabama. We met some really fantastic people. And what I loved as we went further and further south and further and further um, to kind of just normal places where people live. It wasn't like New York where, you know, that it's just for tourists or it's not just for tourists, but, you know, like it's special and like everyone's used to having visitors and stuff. It was really, you know, places where like just normal people live and they were really welcoming and really happy to see us. And and we actually even started thinking like, I'd love to live here. We, we want to, you know, I definitely didn't want to live in England and I was looking for my my perfect place but um yeah we uh we had a really great time after the so it completely cancelled out the horrible camp experience and when I got back home um, I just kind of felt like I really wanted to 
travel again, you know, like it was kind of a bit of a come down being back home. And um, this time I, I wanted to, I wanted to get to know Europe a bit better. Um, and so I basically went on a travel all around Europe. Um, and, you know, you'd be amazed that you can do this, like on, on not such a big budget. Um, we, you know, I, I was only working in a restaurant and I managed to save up enough money over six months. And a friend and I took a car and we went camping and staying in hostels. And we, um, we went all around and saw like really some amazing places. And uh, I was really fascinated by Eastern Europe. And I definitely thought I have to come back here. Um, and I, I was kind of taking notes, like what places could I, because my next plan was like, let's see if I can live somewhere else. Um, yeah, so when I came back, I decided um, on Hamburg because basically because I got a job there as an English teacher. And um, so that was my first kind of real taste of Germany. And uh, I didn't speak any German at all. So that's not it. I definitely didn't choose Germany because I could speak German. And uh, I'd actually learn a bit of French at school, but really my language skills were zero. And um, <clears throat> Yeah, I I liked the people. I had a great time. Um, I was astounded at how difficult learning German was. I I actually went to Germany thinking that I would pick up the language in six months. And I'm sure that there are talented people who can do that. Um, but yeah, I'm not one of them. Um, I don't think... I have a special natural talent for languages, but I had the desire to learn. So um, it didn't really work out learning the language in six months. And uh, I actually found most of the time that because I was an English teacher, I just, I was required to speak English most of the time. So there really wasn't much opportunity. And by the end of the six months, I could really only say basic things, but I was starting to understand German. And that's one thing I learned about languages is that understanding always comes first. Um, you can't start learning to speak a language before you really understand it. Um, but I still had this thing about Eastern Europe and uh, decided to take a job opportunity that came to me uh, in Bulgaria. And uh, so I, I worked there um, and loved it. In fact, I could have stayed in Bulgaria. I I just, it was like the people and the, the, the it was, it's so magical. I love the landscape. Um, I, I think, I don't know, there was just something really special about it. But also on the other hand, it was very, very difficult for me because I'm not from there and I will never be. And it just, well, it's really difficult to explain. Um, I would love, I would have loved for it to have worked out um, but it just, it just, it, it wasn't meant to be. And, um, so after that, um, I decided to go back to England, um, but not before taking another trip, um, around America. This time I went to Texas cause I have friends there and, um, and traveled around as well. Driving. We went to Vegas, um, Mainly not, really, I mean, just to have fun in Vegas. We were just there for a couple of days, but um, it was mainly because of the trip there that we chose to go in that direction. Just, um, it's a long way, um, but the scenery was amazing. One of the other things I absolutely love about America is how there's so many different types of landscape and um, the way it changes. To me, I, I mean, when people say that there aren't different cultures in America, I don't understand that because, okay, they're all American. Everybody in America is American, but I think that from state to state, people have very different cultures. And if you just, you know, really go and explore that, you can find um, different ways in different states. And um, that's what I enjoy when I go there now. I probably, I would go to New York, but it's not like, um, it, that's not the thing I enjoy the most about, about traveling. I really want to see how the people live. Um, and 
But I think in the end, my favorite state is probably, um, yeah, Tennessee because it's so beautiful. And I ended up going again to, I'd, I'd been once before, like on, on the first time and, and went again. And I just, I love the scenery there the most because it's green and um, the mountains and the little, the things that you find, the creatures that you find there, like, <laughs> what am I thinking? Hummingbirds. And so, I mean, we don't have those. So I'm like, I was like fascinated um of course i still haven't seen the whole of america and i would love to go back um it's a little more difficult now with a child to just go on a road trip i mean they, they don't really enjoy that um but yeah anyway after that i went back again to england and um yeah this feeling that i don't belong there is was still very strong now I try to describe this a little bit. It's not that I don't feel English. I do. Um, I feel it, especially now that I'm not there. I'm, I, I feel like I stick out as someone English. Um, but um, I don't feel like it's the right place for me to grow, like for me to learn. And I feel like I, ca you can, I can only come to a certain point in England and I don't, I, I can't grow anymore. If that makes any sense. And, um, yeah, one of the things I love as well about being in another country is that when you meet new people, they're like a mystery, they're like a new, um, you don't know where to put them in your mind. I know that it's wrong to, be, to put people in categories and um, none of us want to do it, but the subconscious mind does it automatically. It's like a kind of survival skill that you meet somebody and your 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 mind is kind of scanning them and trying to put them into a category so that you feel safe. And when that person is from your country, you can very easily do that. And I love that my mind is unable to do that with foreign people because you don't really um, have that same sense of like, oh, I bet I know where this person grew up, what kind of a background they come from. And, you know, my mind can't really do that. So I love that every day you feel like something fresh, like a new challenge, something that you can learn and, and that you're just more open without that distraction of like, I know this already. So every day there's something new here. Um, yeah, and I guess maybe I've always wanted that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I decided this time to give it some thought, like what would be a really great place for me to spend a real bit of time and um, get to know the language. Um, and, you know, not just stay six months, really try and see, see if you can live somewhere. And uh, I thought, well, I already learned a little bit of German, so it would seem kind of a waste to, uh, you know, to start again with another language. Although I wasn't, I, I was still open to that. Um, on the other hand, I loved that magical feeling that I had in Bulgaria because of this, um, yeah, this massively different culture. You know, it's an Eastern country, it's an Eastern European country. They had a completely different regime um, and um, they have a different mentality. And um, somehow in Hamburg, I thought that mentality was not enough unlike England. You know, I, I wanted it to be a little bit more foreign. Um, so I thought about it and then I thought, hey, why not Berlin? Because, you know, Berlin also, because Germany was itself divided. So Berlin is, is, is more, well, half of it is East, um, East German. And um, perhaps that gives you a little bit more of that flavor, you know, of, of like something very, very different from what I'm used to happened here. Um, so um, I, I decided I'll give it a go. So I came to Berlin. And uh, I must admit that um, despite the fact that I came at probably one of the worst, coldest winters that Berlin had experienced in a very long time, um, I fell in love with Berlin pretty much straight away. And I, I got myself a, a room on the, on the east side of Berlin. Um, it was great. Like the, I loved the train station that I would get off at and you could see the TV tower and just this special feeling in Berlin. And, and I really used to sometimes just stop and say, oh, I love this city. I, I really had that feeling. Um, I was also lonely. I didn't know anybody. Um, 
And this winter just was bitter. I mean, it um, it got to the point where you couldn't really leave the house um, without falling over, you know, especially in the evenings. Like if I was to just walk around the block, it wouldn't be possible to do it without slipping because no matter how often they salted the, the pathways and so on, it would just ice over again. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time in my in my little room looking out of the window, hearing the ice falling down and feeling lonely, but also feeling excited and seeing that this view out of the window of this foreign city and knowing that there was loads of opportunities here. And just, um, I also had a job uh, in, a, in a fashion, I was working in a fashion company and because uh, they would, they had an English website that they wanted to work on and they needed someone who could write. And um, I really hoped that, you know, I would kind of maybe meet some people there, but it didn't work out that way. Somehow I found Berliners to be very closed and not really open to, they were, they'd talk to you, but they didn't really want to see you like outside of work or anything like that. Even my flatmates, so I was living in a shared flat, I had two German flatmates and I tried as well to, to talk to them when we saw each other in the kitchen. They weren't really interested. So I was really starting to feel a bit, um, a bit sad, you know, that I, I couldn't really connect to people. Um, and yeah, the, the winter started to come to an end. So this, it was starting to become a bit sunny and but I still had this feeling maybe that although I love the city, I'm not sure how I can make it happen here, you know, and really get some roots. And also my job was going to be coming to an end because, um, you know, once the website was up and running, they, they didn't really need uh, me anymore. And I was having problems to find another job. Um, yes, and one day after work, um, someone came to talk to me, which surprised me because that didn't happen very often. And um, it was a girl who worked in one of the other departments and uh, I'd seen her around, but I didn't know her. And she came to ask me what I, you know, what I was working on. She seemed interested. And I noticed that she actually also wasn't German. She wasn't from Berlin. So I asked her where she was from. And it turns out she was from Bulgaria. So that was kind of, um, yeah, straight away I was like, what, you know, I used to, I, I used to live there. And so we kind of bonded on that. And she also was lonely, you know, she didn't know anyone. And she was also finding it hard to connect to people from, from Berlin. So we decided straight away, let, let's go out for dinner next week or something. And, um, maybe, yeah, just try and make stuff happen. And, um, she actually then found out about a foreign gathering. It was like an international, you know, for people who aren't from Berlin, that where they can go and share ideas and stuff. It sounded great. And so we decided that we would go there after dinner. And it was really awful. It was like everything was, was false. And, uh, you know, there was someone who was there to greet you and they would like ask you questions like, where are you from? And, oh, maybe you would like to talk to this person because they're also from, and everybody was making this like very forced conversations and there was a lot of silence and it, we just thought, okay, um, this isn't going, we're not going to meet anyone here. Um, but it was worth it cause it was funny. So we, um, we laughed a lot about it when we got out of there. We decided, you know, it's still early, let's do something. Um, we decided maybe we would like to play pool or billiard. And we found a bar where they have billiard tables. And uh, it was absolutely packed. And there were already people playing billiard. And there was money, you know, lined up for the next people to play and so on. So, um there was just pretty much no chance of us getting a table. And uh, we decided, okay, so kind of a disaster, And uh, but never mind, let's still have fun. How about um, we, we back a team, you know? So there were two guys who were mainly playing because they were really good. And uh, I said, okay, you support this guy and I support this guy and let's see who wins. So we're still kind of playing. And uh, it turned out that the guy that I was supporting was Hendrik. And, um, yeah, that, uh, 
he kind of noticed that we were watching the game. So we, we got talking and um, I hadn't actually noticed, you know, that he was cute or anything like that before he'd started talking to me. I, I, there was no kind of like, I want to support this guy. It wasn't really like that. I had, it was too crowded. I was too busy in my head. I hadn't noticed. It was only when he started talking to me that I thought, oh, okay, M nice guy, you know. And um, then it turned out as well that, because uh, my friend also was there, she's from Bulgaria, and he also used to live in Bulgaria. And um, that's not something usual, you know. I don't know really many people who've even been on holiday there. So he'd actually lived there for three years working in a company. Um, so he knew Sophia really well. He knew some of the places that I knew, and it was just really great, you know, like to suddenly meet people, just it all happened at once, you know. And, um, you know, that they understood things that I understood. And it was just, um, yeah, I couldn't believe it. And suddenly my life kind of changed. So I loved the city, met some great people. The only thing now was um, that I didn't have a, a job or, you know, when this job was ending. And I uh, wasn't sure, you know, whether I could stay. And so I ended up trying my best to get anything. So I ended up working as a waitress in this really ridiculous restaurant, honestly. It was, and, and they don't actually tip really here. So I thought at least maybe I could live from my tips, but um, in Germany, it's not really a thing. Like, like sometimes they don't tip you at all, um, even if, you know, you gave them really good service. Um, yeah, and, and, and it's really hard because often every single person pays for their own meal. So let's say that you've got like a party of like 20 people that came in and then you go to, they want to pay. So you have to calculate every single person's meal and then they all pay and then no one tips you. But while you've been doing this calculation of 20 people, of course, all your other tables are like, hey, we need some service, you know, because it takes forever. So I, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, but I didn't have any choice because I was, I could only just pay the rent with this. Um, but I got to know Hendrik a lot better and I really wanted to stay. And, uh, he also wanted me to stay. So he helped me a lot as well with applying for jobs because, you know, he is native, he's actually from Berlin. So, so yes, I did end up meeting someone who's actually from Berlin and, um, he helped me and, and I ended up finding a teaching job again. And uh, he, um, yeah, he was also my key to learning German. Um, because, yeah, to this point, I understood German, but I only really met people who wanted to speak English to me. And he kind of really helped me to, um, you know, by sometimes speaking German to me, um, you know, just helping me and or like, you know, pointing out ways to express yourself, maybe ones that I wasn't so familiar with. And um, then, of course, came his family. And he's actually from East East Germany. So his family are East German. They, And so the older generation there, they didn't learn English at school. They learned Russian. So his mother, for example, you know, really, uh, English is not very good. And my German was actually better than her English. So um, it started there, but I wanted to talk to her. And um, I think it's that, that's the key to learning a language, having the desire to talk to someone in particular. And, uh, and, and just that being your, you know, your, your goal and, and it makes you want to find out more and makes you want to really try because you want to talk to that person. And I would say without that, there's no real learning a language for fun. Not for me. Um, although I like the idea of speaking different languages, I tried also to learn Bulgarian. Um, but um, I'm fascinated by the way that they're structured, the way that they sound. Um, but I just think you can't. Well, definitely for me, I can't. You. It's so hard. Um, it, it can only happen if you really have that, you know, that, that need, like a child, you know, like when the child learns a language, it learns it because it wants to communicate. And it's the same for us, I think. And um, slowly since then, so I've been here for six years now, I've slowly learned better and better. And, um, and now I can talk um, easily, you know, I, 
I would say, of course, people can tell that I'm foreign, you know, and and I may also sometimes word things in a funny way and people have to ask me again, you know, but it would never happen that I absolutely can't express myself. And uh, certainly with Luca, it gets easier. He's teaching me because I learn from the way he's learning German. I can see the mistakes that he learns and, and how I used to make the same mistakes. And that actually some of the mistakes are kind of logical. Um, yeah, but it's it's also been interesting, you know, with bringing up a bilingual child because, um, you know, I see as well what a challenge it is for him to learn two languages. Um, but he is a child and he just wants to talk and he just wants to learn everything. And it's so different from how we end up, you know, that we want to try and make everything logical. Um, yeah, so he actually now speaks very good German, especially because he's starting, he started a play group now and all the kids are German and he wants to talk to them. And he's kind of figured out that the only person who speaks this other weird language is, is mama. And, um, she seems to understand me when I speak German. So at the moment, his German is way better than his English, despite the fact that I spent three years at home with him speaking only English to him. It's, it, you need more than that, you know, and uh, he, he needs that, um, yeah, he, he gets it, that everyone else around him, everything else that he's exposed to is German. Um, but it will come, and, it, and he definitely understands everything I say in English, and sometimes he mixes things up, you know, so he says things that kind of half English and half German. But with time, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of other um, bilingual families, and it's, it's a normal thing that the kids go through, and um, with time, he'll sort it in his mind. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm here to stay. Uh, now that I've moved to a village and, uh, um, you know, have started a family here, um, I think I found my place and I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And especially, I must say, I fell in love with Berlin and I'm glad to still be nearby and still be able to have that to, you know, I, I need every now and then to go to Berlin. I've learned that since, since living here. Um, but I do love this quiet and this, um, you know, new experience of living in the countryside. And um, again, it's a challenge for my German. It's helping me to get better and better all the time because there are no people around here that speak English. Uh, in Berlin, there are hundreds. If anyone out there is thinking, you know, about visiting Berlin and is being worried that, that they might need to learn some German, it's nice as a gesture but there's no need like everybody here speaks English and there, there would be never, there would never be a situation where you at least couldn't turn to the next person and they could help you. If, if the cashier doesn't speak um, English, then the person behind you will speak English and they'll help you and they're keen. So it's, it's very um, Germany compared to a lot of other countries is really high level of, of English speaking and so therefore I even, I think it's good for Luca anyway to, to learn and um, he'll certainly have it at school. Um, so I guess maybe he can relax in his English lessons because he's, he's got me. Um, but yes, we'll be going to England in April, I think I mentioned. Um, so I'm interested to see whether he'll make a bit of a step there because I'll be meeting with friends, they have children too, and he'll meet children who speak English. And um, yeah, we'll have to see if that, um, that actually makes any difference. Um, so yes, I hope that answers all of your questions. Um, it was quite fun actually to tell the story and, um, and, and it's nice for me to remember it all and so on. It's, um, it's certainly been a journey over the last six years. Um, and um, yes, I'll try to gather up my knitting from my mother-in-law or I might even take my rather take my laptop over there and we'll, we'll see how how things work out um, and uh, hopefully yeah it won't be too long then before I catch up with you again soon and so until then enjoy your your knitting and crafting and don't forget that um, you could always leave comments um, I guess I don't really have much to um, write in the show notes this time um, but um, I usually with everything that I mention I put it in the show notes um, 
in case anyone has any questions. I've also um, started a chat thread. So, you know, because it does get a bit quiet, yeah, especially because I tend to do the monthly, although I'm kind of changing that, trying to, I'm not, I'm doing podcasts basically now when it's right, when, and it might be a bit more often than a month. But in between times, it's nice to catch up just about anything. Plus another thread I've created for, um, you know, for our other projects, you know, that aren't knitting. Um, because sometimes people mention to me things that they've done. And it's also nice to be able to see them as well. I can see all of your nice knitting projects, but some of the other things um, that you make, sometimes I only hear about them, but I don't get to see them. So that's, that's also a nice place that we can do that. So yes, until next time, um, yeah, have a great month or a few weeks, hopefully, and I'll talk to you again soon. Goodbye.